Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Monday Satsang. We will uh, do a small Mangala Charanam and then we start our class. Om Shri Guru Pyo Namaha Hari Om Om Sahana Vavatu Sahana Bhunaktu Saha Vidyan Karavavahe Tejasvinavadhi Tamastuma Vit Vishavahe Om Shanti 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 Om Tatsata So, Pranam Siswami Narayana Nandaji, who is here recording for us today. So, thanking him, and we will start our discussion. <coughs> so, we have discussed, <coughs> excuse me, we have discussed various topics in the past months in our session. And there had been some questions and answers. So whenever there were questions from the participants, I feel that had been more directly useful than me choosing a topic and going ahead. And it being a passive listening from the side of the listeners. Because the nature of our topic is nishta, which means being established in something. So whatever we learn, there is a lot of information available. No matter the domain, you may be in uh, uh, any domain of knowledge. Currently, our context is spiritual knowledge. There is no limit to the amount of information that you can access, you know, from Google, from gurus, from lectures. So availability of information, availability of lectures and uh, explanations from so many perspectives, they are endless, you know, internet is full of them. There are thousands and millions and millions of books. But if we see the availability is so much, yet if you see the implementation in our everyday life, if you see how much of that is really functioning, how much of that is really implemented in our everyday life, it's a huge question mark. Even the individual exposure, I'm talking about the case of people with a lot of exposure. There are people who attend courses and courses for years and years together in ashrams, in Rishikesh, and everywhere else, in holy places. They attend online classes. It's going on, but somehow the rut of everyday life you know, is gripping our consciousness, is gripping the flow of our consciousness is not smooth. It's gripping it. It's putting a block on the flow of consciousness towards wisdom. And we get stagnated into small pools of everyday issues. The flow of our, the love of God, it doesn't flow. The love of freedom, the love of eternal happiness, the love of the spirit, it does not flow smoothly. The thoughts, the feelings, our energies are not in line or directed through all our activities. It's not directed sufficiently for most of us. That is the struggle. You know? So translate that information 
into abidance. That is our challenge. And that is exactly the purpose of our Monday satsang here. So for this to be really effective, for you as a listener and as a participant, if you are in the Zoom class, you are a participant. If you are in YouTube, you listen. Even a YouTube listener can become a participant. By taking up a point and thinking about it and looking at the way the life experiences affect us and see where is the gap between where I want to be spiritually and where I am and what is stopping me and how to overcome. You know, when we think about these things, then when, when we really approach it in a more conscious way, we will have definitely some, you know, some questions. So even if you have some insights, you can share in your everyday practice, you can share some insights. And we can try to see how they are relevant, those insights. And if you have some questions, how those questions and issues can be addressed from a Shastric point of view, from the from the ancient traditional wisdom that has been handed over to us in this tradition, in the yogic tradition, in the Vedantic tradition. So we can see how it can be implemented, how we can uh, take examples from the lives of saints and how we can uh, use our modern knowledge. And I can also share my experience and see how we can improve the reality of our everyday spirituality. The reality of spiritual spiritual component in our life, the, how much our bodies, our energies, our mind, our intellect, our ego is directed or in tune with the spiritual reality of life. Yeah. So that is why I keep asking for participation. So I am presenting the appeal once again here. If there is any question, we can start the class with question. I will give a minute. If not, we can, I have, I have a, uh, if there is no questions like usual, I, I usually come with a topic. I have a topic in mind. I can start with that. Namaste, Yogeshwarji. It's Pranav. Namaste, Namaste. I, I yes. do have a question. What actually. is the prayer? Wonderful. I can't believe because this is very deeply connected to the topic I chose today. I was thinking, what can we talk about today? I wanted to talk about how to bring our relationship with God in everyday life and how to deal with the concept of prayer and how to bring integrate prayerfulness in our everyday life. This exactly was in my mind before the class. It was amazing that you, uh, Roberta has asked that and uh, another person has asked how to build awareness for mudha nature of mind. Any particular practice. Okay, very good. Very good. Uh, can I have a, a my question is what is the difference between responsibility and sacrifice? Wonderful. wonderful. Um, so it's a dharmic conflict. Sometimes we need to make so much effort to finish Swadharma for society. It may be hurting myself to avoid himsa to oneself. How can I clarify? Good, good, good. Very good. So these are very deep questions. I think I will address these three questions. And if I still have some time left, we will proceed. Now, I will I will go from the last question. No, no first I will go from the second question. The second question is connected with the quality of nature called Tamoguna because that is the one that needs to be addressed first in the order of things. And then it comes to responsibility, sacrifice and action that is Rajoguna associated. And uh, the first question is connected with prayer and prayerfulness and surrender. It is Sattva Guna associated. So I will go from Tamas to Rajas to Sattva. Right? Okay. <clears throat> so, right. so we, sometimes we need to make so much effort to complete or accomplish our sudharma for the society. Yeah. Now, when it comes to 
dharma for the society in our times the main thing we need to see is is my profession my swadharma you know let us say duty and responsibility oh my god uh, oh we have one more okay uh, so see when you are talking about responsibility and this sacrifice yeah i so the main guideline the person has given herself uh, the person has given the main guide it may be hurting myself to avoid himsa to oneself how can i clarify correct very good so the whole purpose of dharma we have to really understand this the whole purpose of dharma is one zone welfare first and foremost is one zone welfare altruistic thinking you know reaching out to others reaching out to society these are wonderful values but they are to be taken care after we take care of ourselves now when it comes to ahimsa there are two levels ahimsa for others and ahimsa for oneself and not hurting is a dharma is a is a great uh, virtue similarly himsa for the sake of protecting dharma is also a virtue that is generally used when it comes to kshatriya dharma so for example waging a war for a righteous cause a police a policeman hurting a dacoit or a thief to protect the normal uh, to protect the righteous citizens from a unlawful uh, person that action of violence done by a policeman is dharma right so so it both ways similarly in very rare circumstances when we are talking about responsibility and sacrifice the sacrifice part is a rare thing it is an exception sacrifice is not the rule responsibility is the rule so when we are fulfilling our responsibility we are sacrificing our likes and dislikes in the sense we are sacrificing our selfishness so that is we we can call it as inner growth so we are using the context of our responsibilities for the purpose of inner growth so that we should not call it as a sacrifice uh you know i sacrificed all my pleasures for the sake of my family see the pleasure itself is to be enjoyed only after fulfillment of responsibility so dharma artha and kama right so one cannot earn wealth by plundering another person if i want to become rich so wonderful virtue to become rich is excellent to become rich but in the process of me becoming rich a few others are made poor deliberately and that is the only way i can become rich then that is not the right way to become rich so i cannot compromise the means for an end in the same way kama kama is pleasure it's not just sexual pleasure any kind of pleasure is kama basically doing something for the joy of it for the pleasure of it for the sake of enjoyment for the sake of vishayananda that is kama okay so just like how earning of wealth cannot compromise dharma similarly enjoying of pleasure also cannot compromise dharma dharma is the foundation dharma means righteousness ethics morality we can say common sense ethics in this case uh, let us forget about vishesha dharma that is not relevant for our context right here it's all right so we'll just for everybody's sake normal common sense ethics right 
like non violence like this person has mentioned non violent common ethics right so for the sake of my enjoyment i cannot compromise normal common sense ethics and maybe a little extra spiritual ethics in certain specific circumstances which also are built on top of common sense ethics for example we have uh, examples from the life of saints so there was a great master who walked all the way from in those days you know it not not you cannot fly in a, there was no flight in those days like now so they have to go by foot from rameshwaram to varanasi and from varanasi to rameshwaram so this person was coming with ganga jalam to do abhishekam for ramanatha swami in rameshwaram so it is the return journey from kashi a great master so there was a person who was dying of thirst and there was a, you know these people they had ganga jalam but that has cannot be shared if you share it it becomes uh, like a leftover that cannot be used for abhishekam of the lord uh, i mean puja for the worship ritual huh? but this saint did not even hesitate one second it was in a very difficult situation but there was no water available he used this ganga water he has been carrying for thousands of kilometers you know more than 2000 kilometers almost from varanasi to rameshwaram by walk by foot they have been carrying that he did not hesitate to use that water to quench the thirst of a dying person and to facilitate that soul's uh, peaceful journey because when ganga water is believed to give a person moksha or sadgati Uh, at the right path after death so the saint did not hesitate at all by by doing that that saint has demonstrated common sense ethics prevails over special rules common sense ethical rules are even more important than special ritualistic or religious rules that may apply on very specific context they are on top of common sense ethics it is not at the cost of common sense ethics so like that we have numerous examples so sacrifice is okay under exceptional circumstances sacrifice cannot be made into a you know uh, like a performance target who sacrificed more you sacrifice or i sacrifice so it becomes a it don't it it is it's really funny it might sound very funny when i say but people do make a big competition out of who sacrifices more you know <laughs> that becomes a ego feeding mechanism so all kind then it, all these kind of errors can happen so sacrifice is good responsibility and sacrifice that's a very thin line and uh, as a policy fulfilling responsibility does not mean sacrificing one's welfare so here when we say sacrifice i mean sacrificing one's physical health physical welfare mental health etc and if at all one sac- one has to sacrifice certain creature comforts that is all right for uh, if if one has to sacrifice uh, a non essential desire you know? for example a teenage person a college student might argue that i have to have the latest season this this current 2024 spring summer collection of whatever brand some let us say a dress or a or a pant or something or a sh- or a, some kind of apparel okay that that the kid wants to have now it is very essential for the boosting of the self image among the peer group but in the framework of absolute standards and values in the framework of normal healthy eternal values this is not an essential it is a luxury so one has to develop the common sense to understand what is essential and what is luxury and sacrificing the luxury for the sake of someone else's welfare or for the sake of fulfilling fulfilling one's responsibility because someone else's welfare becomes another headache because there are always going to be people who suffer the world will never be free from suffering we need to understand this. 
there is always going to be some hunger somewhere there is always going to be some war somewhere there is always going to be decoitry and killing and all kinds of nonsense somewhere or that there is going to be some famine so the earth is a combination of people living their good karmas and bad karmas right earth is a place of churning where in human life we are earning good karma and working out our bad karmas and generally rising in virtue and becoming ready for self knowledge we can put that as the journey of the spiritual journey of the human being so a scenario where there is no suffering in the world at all is not going to happen and definitely not in the next 425000 years definitely not in uh, you know uh, in kali yuga it's not going to happen so i will enjoy my life only when everybody is enjoying their life it's a very noble thought but uh, sorry to use the word it's a very stupid thought because everybody enjoying their life is not going to happen so you will never enjoy the life then one can get depressed and very uh, you know uh, very bitter and all that so that's not the way when i say sacrificing some creature comforts for others that is if fulfilling the other person's essential need is within your responsibility then like for example there is not enough money to feed our feed my family to arrange for food for my family for the next 3 days right there is not enough budget or the budget is just enough only for the next 3 days when i will be getting my salary or whatever right but suddenly i am overwhelmed by the need to have a pizza but if i have the pizza the whole family has to go hungry for the next two days let us say then i cannot have the pizza i will have to sacrifice my desire for pizza and keep the money to take care of the family it's a basic common sense this is the responsibility now i am giving an extreme scenario so there can be but use the logic try to understand the logic so sacrificing one's creature comforts and pleasures for the sake of fulfilling responsibility is not sacrifice we have to understand that clearly so what is sacrifice which is over and above fulfilling one's responsibility that's what we need to understand so in in the process of fulfilling my responsibility i will have to find an intelligent way to take care of myself also because taking care of myself is part of fulfilling the responsibility but going over and above my responsibility sometimes we develop fake values yeah so now i have to take care of the let us uh, let us take care of for example uh, a very common problem these days you know Uh, especially in india taking care of the elderly taking care of the elderly parents is a responsibility yes now this elderly parents could be from some other generation they may have their own quirks they may have their own issues and they may have their own emotional baggage from their life now taking care of their needs physical needs is possible taking care of to a certain extent of support to a certain extent of their emotional support is possible but they have a responsibility for their own mental health their own emotional health they are supposed to have developed some vairagya they are supposed to have developed some maturity over time they are supposed to do some introspection and all that now if that person is emotionally blackmailing the whole family because they have not become mature in the old age or they you call it a second childhood sometimes they become senile so many reasons you know so the young person is building up his or her life that person need not give up everything the essential thing to take care of each and every emotion of this old person that would be a sacrifice which is not very intelligent 
so that is not necessary so that person is suffering because of their own the elderly person is suffering because of his or her own mental issues that's not our that's not the problem of the children that's not the problem of the son or the daughter or the daughter in law right so it is their responsibility to take care of their mind if they are not able to take care of their mind god you know god bless them uh, let us we can pray for them a little bit but more than that is not required at all that doesn't become uh, that is not our responsibility so this understanding what is the responsibility itself is a huge topic of discussion one in each context one has to uh, analyze individually like we say desha kala patra right in where what is the context what is the time period and for whom all these factors the whole context individual context has to be taken into account and a discussion need to be made to arrive at the clarity of what is responsibility in this context and what is sacrifice in this context there are no absolute there are absolute principles you know there are values there are eternal values and principles but they are only giving you broad guidance like ahimsa you know taking care of the aged parents taking care of your children being loyal to one's partner uh, you know being uh, uh, devoted to one's family uh, bringing the spiritual culture in the family uh, discharging one's responsibility in the work in the office so these things are there and uh, you know there can be nowadays if you go to the workplace we have to see i am following dharma but is the organization following dharma is my boss following dharma is my co are my coworkers following dharma so everybody else is uh, adharmic and i will follow dharma and you know like a pwd guy i will just know the public works department you know, let them do that job when they want i will dig the road and put the cable and go so tomorrow the uh, uh, you know it, it becomes like uh, today the road department comes and lays the road tomorrow the telephone department comes and digs up the road so it should not be like that you no know, i just keep doing my duty there are people like that you no know, it becomes like a uh, it, it becomes like a sense of escape uh, to for me to do my duty in work i am good i do my duty in my work i don't care what another person is doing they may all not do so this becomes a kind of a very narrow minded attitude of self protection ego self righteousness kind of attitude you know the self righteous attitude which protects our ego so that is not a very healthy thing so when we are coming to discharging our responsibility even in the office so we have to see the context again and we have to see uh, what is my responsibility written responsibility and what is my unwritten responsibilities so there are certain uh, things that i will have to take care and there are certain things where i have to keep away not bother about it and there are certain things where if the whole environment is adharmic probably i will have to leave that job sometimes so we can really not say uh, like do this we cannot say we can only say there are some broad guidelines and each context has to be discussed individually with somebody who is wise enough to uh, make you really look at uh, your own errors and your own perspectives and what is how things are affecting you and what is the reality of the context against the back, background of generic dharma and then we have to decide on each context but definitely when it comes to sacrifice over and above one's responsibility going out of one's way to get something done by compromising one zone welfare one zone safety etc is an extraordinary situation it is not everyday situation it is something like a soldier in the front line of the war ready to sacrifice his life for saving the country that is an exceptional situation to save his platoon one soldier goes on sacrifices his life and you know destroys the enemy that that's a supreme sacrifice they say so these are all great things as a soldier it's a great thing but it's an exceptional situation let us not make exceptional cases of sacrifice the norm and part of our discourse on responsibility 
so i hope this gives a broad perspective to deal with this uh, uh, hurting oneself is not an option unless it is an exceptional situation whether it is a exceptional situation or not even there it is not your responsibility you are not required to hurt yourself if you hurt yourself for a bigger cause that's that's your calling you you that that's your decision but you have to see is it exceptional enough is the price paid for that outcome whatever is the reason for which i am paying the price that you know is it worth it and is it that urgent and if i really want to do it it's all right but i have to see is it exceptional enough so that is the question one has to ask when it comes to sacrifice over and above the responsibility which may hurt one's welfare yeah next step uh we say the purpose of yoga is to attain clear thinking but what specifically does yoga give clear thinking about <laughs> excellent two people with similar levels of sadhana and mental purification uh may still disagree on issues such as politics or may have differing opinions on views or different situations or topics i also heard great practitioners and teachers use logical fallacies in the thinking or have the thinking shaped by cultural or social background wonderful question so we will go into this after answering the other questions yeah. wonderful question i will i will keep this in mind uh, i am not i am afraid uh, pranav if i will be able to address this today but let me see after addressing the other question how to build awareness for the mood or nature of the mind any particular matter so i don't understand uh, exactly what you mean uh, here can you give me whoever wrote this question can you give me an example a situation you can turn on your mic and give me an example and then i can proceed there is awareness of the mood or means uh, the mood or in the sense uh, uh, you're talking about laziness or indolence or lack of attention the questioner is here lack of attention okay great so lack lack of attention is uh, here let us say more like a forgetfulness and swooning forgetfulness yes correct got it so two things help in this what any particular practice uh, the mood or nature of the mind happens because of uh, usually wrong lifestyle hmm? uh, lack of sleep and things like that mental conflict which drains your mental energy and uh, unhealthy food the tamasic food so first what we have to do is to make sure our food is okay food and sleep are okay you have to make sure about that because practices yogic practices are not a replacement for the right way of life right way of life including the right food correct rest correct amount of rest uh, balanced amount of work and all that these are fundamental uh, and uh, practice of the right values in life these are fundamental and the yoga practices are for improving our condition on top of these things yeah so uh, in this context when it comes to the mood or nature of the mind one has to look at the food am i eating too much of refrigerated food old food etc i have to check that out and uh, after fixing all that two practices are especially helpful for this uh, uh, problem one is pranayama another is japa now you can also combine japa with pranayama and we can combine certain concentration technique called dharanas you can you can combine that with japa for example in japa uh, we do this you you count from 1 to 10 in the fingers you know using the phalange of the fingers we count the middle the middle of the ring finger 
in the right hand and then the one below then uh, number three will be the bottom of the little finger then the middle phalanx and the top phalanx of the little finger that's five then the tip of the middle finger tip of the ring finger tip of the index finger the middle phalanx of the index finger and then the bottom of the index this is a, a traditional way of counting in hand right now when you go one and then you come back it's 20 20 counts they generally they do in japa like that or let us say you are using a rosary and you are counting right you have to keep in mind how many rounds you are making you will have to remember in the head and you have to chant your mantra that will help you and one more when you do pranayama when we do pranayama there is a technique called shambhavi mudra shambhavi mudra is basically you concentrate on the eyebrow center you lift your eyes and concentrate there is a v there is a dark v where both the eyebrows are merging right so you you look into that dark space between the eyebrows above the eyebrow center inside keeping your body straight and then when you're doing that you you relax and you direct the you direct your background attention towards that you direct your background attention for example when you are now looking at the computer screen or whatever you have this peripheral vision right the peripheral vision is trying to like suppose a small beetle fly comes flying around you you will immediately duck and then you will try to you know uh, send it away if somebody else is coming in the corner of the room you will turn and see who is coming so first your peripheral attention is all over the place it's picking up right so you have to direct consciously you look at the eyebrow center and allow your peripheral attention to gradually converge into the space behind the eyebrow center gradually you take time you take a lot of time let it converge there and as it is converging there you sustain a steady rhythm of breathing just inhale a little deeper consciously inhale a little deeper and exhale in a controlled manner Con complete exhalation so you maintain a steady rhythmic slow steady rhythmic deep breathing while you are working with this peripheral attention converging in the eyebrow center it's called dharana right so you may do that and after it converges to a decent extent you know once you start feeling that space you visualize the deity you visualize any any divine form that inspires you you visualize in that space in details you know try try to visualize that keep your busy and as you are visualizing when the visualizing becomes a little steady try to remember the name of the divine form or the mantra that you know about the divine form or some shloka you can do that right and then uh, once that becomes a little uh, intense and your mind you are able to recollect the mantra and the shloka your mind is gravitating in the mantra or the shloka forget about the breathing forget about that visualization eyebrow center nothing just close your eyes and concentrate on the sound of that mantra as you repeat it in your mind your your tongue should not move the lips should not move you only think that mantra you repeat it and as you are repeating the words try to appreciate the meaning of the words and while doing that you are maintaining a steady posture right now what you do once you have gotten a grip of that mantra sit relaxed sit relaxed stretch but see if you can keep your mind on the words and the meaning of the words of the mantra 
without moving the tongue without moving the lips. See how the attention is. So that will tell you when you let go of your guard. You know, when you let go of your guard and when you are relaxed, is the mind going into forgetfulness? Or that usually when you, you know when you lounge, when you leave your guard and lounge, usually the mind will go into daydreaming. So the daydreaming mind, the mind that usually goes into daydreaming, you will have to use that mind for repeating the mantra. Usually you cannot catch that mind. We only catch ourselves, suddenly we catch ourselves remembering some movie song. Suddenly we catch ourselves thinking about something else. And then, you know, somebody has to shake their hand in front of our face and then we'll say, ha, huh? did you call me? Right? So, that's how the mudha comes in. That lack of attention and forgetfulness comes in when we are not on our guard. Right? It takes us away. So, what we have to do we will have to catch that dimension of the mind. We have to awaken our faculty of choice. You know, we have a faculty of choice. That faculty of choice is not awakened in that level of the mind. So the first practice that I told you, that pranayama, concentrating on the eyebrow center, visualizing, and from there going to the mantra, and after that, relaxing. That lounging and then trying to stay with the mantra. This practice, takes our attention, the initial practice takes our attention to the subtle level of the mind where our attention, where the attention naturally shifts from one thing to another. So there I have to keep on remembering the word, the meaning of the word. When I remember the word and the meaning of the word, I feel the emotion connected to that. So you have to use a very familiar kind of a mantra or a shloka or a prayer. Even a very simple thing, you know. Uh, uh, let us say Gajananam Bhutakanati Sevitam Kapitta Jambu Palasar Bhakshitam, right? Uh, for example, Gajananam Bhutakanati Sevitam, the, the one who is with the elephant face, the one who is worshipped by all the Bhutakanas, like that you have, you know. You can even uh, be a small prayer in your own mother tongue. It doesn't have to be a Sanskrit shloka. You can be a, a you know, a, a, a very simple prayer. It can be in English or something else. Or any words that is meaningful, like a verse from Bhagavad Gita, something that you have enjoyed, something that you have internalized, something that you is emotionally close to you. Try to repeat that in the mind and enjoy the meaning of the words as you repeat. But without moving your lips, without moving the tongue, while sitting in a very comfortable manner, like you know, you are in lounging in a chair or something, or in a sofa where you tend to become forgetful. The body posture makes you forgetful usually. So you go into the body posture that lets you to be forgetful, where you are relaxed, a relaxed body posture, but you are working with this in the mind. To catch the mind in that level is a knack. So by you doing that preparatory practice of pranayama and concentration on the eyebrow center, you will develop the knack to catch the mind in the subtle level. So once you know how to catch the mind in the subtle level, you can catch the mind no matter what is the body posture. So you have to do that practice. You know, it's like an exercise. It's like a brain gym, it's like kind of an exercise. So whenever you have free time, try to remember some shloka or some words and see the meaning and repeat it in the mind, the words in the mind while enjoying the meaning of it without moving your tongue, without moving your lips a few times. Or visualize a deity and keep your attention on the details of the deity without trying to sit very upright and, you know, Padmasana kind of thing. Not like a very active meditation, but a very relaxed, chill kind of a, a approach, but you're only working with that mind. So wherever the, whenever the mind goes away, like how a mind remembers a random song from that you heard somewhere on your way. How a mind remembers a song. Like that, the mind learns to dwell upon the topic that you have chosen to dwell upon. So this technique will help in uh, overcoming that inattention and forgetfulness of the mind. Usually, a little bit of pranayama before doing that and attention on the concentration on the eyebrow center done from time to time will help you to do this.
otherwise it will be very difficult you can't catch that dimension of the money so if you are uh, not able to catch at all that means uh, you have to do a little more pranayama and a little more of a, a deliberate japa with counting mental counting you do 10 or 20 you see how many rounds you are doing how many rounds i have done i have to remember that or i have to remember up to 10 and for every 10 i count one one bead for every 10 repetitions i i count one bead in my mala something like that so that i have a chance to remember how many repetitions i have done uh, uh, exercise in memory and exercise in repetition yeah so that is that is how you deal with that because a mind losing itself in a certain track of thought or uh, mind uh, losing track of the flow of mind and mind getting lost into something that is what is muda all about and that happens because the bhoga vasana that is the desire for a certain uh, a pleasurable thought sensation you know whatever is the thought that is very pleasurable the mind goes towards that or if it is overcome by tiredness it goes into a kind of a sleep right so it is a it is a habit it's a force of habit it's called tamas and it is overcome with the combination of pranayama and japa these are the primary practices for overcoming yeah. pranayama with kumbhaka basically with retention but that cannot be advocated for everybody uh, so that is, uh, you have to prepare the body and all that. So I am not advocating that. Just simple deep breathing with probably one or two seconds of retention after exhale and one or two seconds of retention after inhale. And you can also combine that with a mantra. It's called Sagarbha Pranayama. You can inhale, for example, let's say Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Is there, right? So from Hare Rama to Rama Rama, Hare Hare, you do in inhale from Hare Krishna until Krishna Krishna Hare Hare, you do exhale or Namashivaya inhale, Namashivaya exhale. One Namashivaya inhale, two Namashivaya exhale. So, like that, you combine chanting of a mantra with breath control. It's called Sagarbha Pranayama. You can do that. That is extremely good for uh, uh, working with this. And if you are a serious practitioner, you can learn properly and practice pranayama with kumbhaka, which will do miracles with this problem of attention and forgetfulness. Even Patanjali says, by the practice of uh, pranayama, the covering of light is destroyed. Tatakshiyate prakasha avarana. By the practice of uh, pranayama, the covering of the light. Covering of the light means the darkness, the force of darkness in the mind that pushes the mind towards inattention and forgetfulness. That is what is mainly the covering of the light. And that doesn't allow you to become aware of the subtle movements of the mind. So that become, that gets cleared by the practice of pranayama. Yeah. So I hope the answer was useful. Uh, and the main thing is to catch the mind the level of, at the level where it is drifting, to wake up the mind to its own error. That is the most important point. That's why I gave this huge explanation. Otherwise, there will be this natural mind trying to become, you know, that inattentive natural habit of forgetfulness will not be addressed at its root. You will constantly be struggling with the forgetful mind, with your practice, and that makes the person tired. So that doesn't really deliver in the long run. So we have to go to the root of the forgetfulness at where the forgetfulness arises in the mind and then turn the tide of the mind. So. For that, what I suggested before will be useful. Uh, uh, we, yes. Namaste. Uh, yes, I have one more question. Namaste. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, just, uh, uh, I would like to ask questions, but I cannot write message. So, uh, yeah, when yeah, I have time, please let me know. Okay? Uh, okay? Right. Okay, you ask your question, I'll keep it in mind. Ah, no, no. Uh, after all, because uh, my question may be a little lengthier, so uh, sure, sure. I, will okay. I will wait. I will answer the next question. Uh, yeah. I have a question. What is prayer? Wonderful. Now, uh, prayer is English word. The equivalent in our uh, uh, Hindu religion, in our Sanatana Dharma, in the Vedic and Yogic tradition, is Prarthana. Prarthana is basically 
you are asking a higher power for something so see i have for example when, when they use the word prayer even in a court room you know so they say when you are submitting a case before a judge you say what is the prayer you know i pray that uh, uh, my client be forgiven and uh, be reduced in the sentence and all those things right or i pray that the accused is uh, given the maximum sentence for his crime like that the prayer it's called basically prayer is a request so what we don't use we have different words for a different generally in english when you say in the western religions they use the word prayer in a more universal way so meditation is also called prayer contemplation is also called prayer then there is this uh, concept told by one saint francis of assisi uh, and also many uh, christian saints they use this word called praying ceaselessly that is praying without break continuous prayer prayer for 24 hours they say so it is not 24 hours you are not asking god for something no, they say okay have mercy and all that because their whole uh, spirituality is based on sin and guilt so it takes another form but when it comes to the vedic religion prayer is a limited thing when i want something to be done what i am doing is i am trying to invoke the divine grace for example what we call in our everyday life as luck you know i say luck i want to i am starting a business so i want to make money so i am starting a business so you can see in india uh, when they open the shop they do a puja after they finish in the evening around 6 o'clock they do a puja uh, so there is a lot of prayer involved in business because there is a lot of uncertainty involved right so when the farmer is sowing the seeds they conduct the prayer to the lord indra for good rains uh, for nice climate and all that so that they will have a bounty crop so when they are uh, harvesting the grain they are offering thanks they are offering the yagna they are offering to the god and thanking the uh, the deities for a great harvest and continue and praying for them to bless them uh, the bless the farm and bless the community for continuous uh, success in farm right so prayer is basically i am looking up to a higher power and i am asking for an intervention that can take care of my luck component so basically i am generating so what happens what we say is every success if i am undertaking a venture like opening a business for example the success depends upon my hard work my smartness and my knowledge and the right measures that i take the success depends upon the cooperating factors in the society and the success also depends upon what they call as my punya my punya means my good karma whatever i have accumulated whenever i taste success it is because my good karma is fructifying fructifying means it is bearing fruit my past good karma is bearing fruit now because it is bearing fruit now the success is manifesting in my life so when i after repeat attempts you know there is uh, no success for a person like this you know we hear about uh, abraham lincoln he said you know whatever he tried repeatedly he kept on failing and finally he succeeded and then he became the president of america it's a big story of how persistently you know uh, the person keeps on trying 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 and one day he will succeed now at the point of it so there are there is the, the it took all this time for the uh, the punya to manifest so that his efforts are bearing fruit so now punya is not the only thing so there may i may have all kinds of punya but still i have to make my own effort now i don't know how much punya 
I have, how much good karma I have that is required for the success. Do I have it or not? I don't know. I have taken care of all the known variables. I have taken care of all the known variables to the best of my knowledge. And my knowledge as an individual is limited. So I can always use some divine grace to bring a blessing where the unknown variables are friendly to me. Yeah. So in any given situation, there are a lot of unknown variables that could affect our uh, success. For example, before beginning this class, I say Sahana Vato, Sahano Bhaktu, Vedyan Karva, there is there is a prayer. So may may he nourish us both. Uh, may he there, let there be no enmity between us. Uh, let may the Lord protect us both. Uh, let may he nourish us both. Uh, may our knowledge enrich each other. You know? So I am create so I am creating a samskara, I am creating a certain let let us call it like this in a very uh, common language, we can use it. I am creating some good karma. So prayer is deliberately creating a certain kind of good karma in the form of grace. Deliberately tapping, communicating with the divine in a very specific way to invoke the grace that is necessary to take care of the variables that are not under my control in a given situation. So that is prayer. A prayer can be for anything. A prayer can be for business and success. A prayer can be for uh, uh, a prayer can be for me uh, completing a certain study program. I want to gain knowledge. So before uh, starting my study, I say Saraswati Namastubhyam Varade Kama Rupanim Vidyarambam Karishyami Hiddir Bhavatame Sada. It's a prayer students do before study. So before eating, you do a prayer, you know, Annapurne, Sada Purne, Shankara Pranavalave, Nana Viragya Siddhyartam Bhikshanti Hichaparvati, it's a prayer. So there are these prayers that we do to recognize, there are two things it does. One, the prayer recognize, rec helps us recognize and recognize in the sense of be aware of because we recognize that is why we do the prayer. But the, by doing the act of prayer, we are reinforcing this awareness of the role of the divine in our everyday life. There is the unseen divine hand that makes that takes life along. It is not simply our effort and it is not random, just some random luck. There is a divine hand in every, every little uh, thing that happens. They say in India, they say, uh, without without the Lord's will, not even a blade of, blade of grass will move. Not even an atom will vibrate without the will of the Lord. They say that. Yeah? So that this is the vision of the saints. This is the vision of the saints and sages that they have given to us. So it is done in a spirit of faith because a common person does not experience the divine like how a yogi or a realized sage experiences the divine. But those masters have given us certain tools to be in tune with the divine. So prayer is an act that invokes the presence of the divine that conducts this world and taps the grace, the divine grace that is required for a particular situation. To take care of the unknown variables that are out of our hand. This is the common basic thing about prayer. So why we need to pray? Why we need to pray? Because we generally think God takes care of everything. God takes care of everything in an impersonal way. God does not have any likes or dislikes. God does not prefer one person over another person. God does not have a plan for you or me. This is one of the main things that we need to understand. Probably we will discuss this uh, role of God in our life, maybe in the next class or some other class. It's a very big topic. 
but just for now for the concept of prayer take this god does not have a plan for you you have a plan for you i have a plan for me now this plan may work or may not work the laws of the universe are there and within the laws of the universe prayer taps into the possibility of invoking the grace i can always invoke the divine grace to make the situations more favorable for my plan so that's what is prayer so invoking the divine grace the impersonal divine is invoked through prayer for my personal wish that is prayer that the so that's how i'll go about it and uh, it's already 7 o'clock maybe we will finish with kanan's question all right uh, namaste namaste sorry again can you hear me well yes very well okay all right the question is uh, let's say i will give a name for it it'll be easy to remember like shades of guna <laughs> uh what i mean here is um, let's say for example the questions we are asking like students different people's questions like everyone wants to know something for their betterment let's say like that so mm. in this uh, even the one may have so much energy like energetic like a, a very uh mm, having energy like a satwa satwa level of energy okay but then uh, uh the questions are for the not the benefit of learning for oneself but then for the questions of oh i can bring a good question or like even if it is not a good question like uh, having a good energy but then not using it uh the no, your question is not very framed very clearly what you do is you frame this question very clearly and we will address this in the next class okay maybe we'll have so, time yeah, also go, okay yeah, yeah you frame it because you are building up the question so we don't have time for that so you all right uh, build up the okay, question I would like to know... and you frame right. the question in very clear terms right. and we will right. address it in the next class okay all right so that it's more Sorry, and thank you yeah, yeah no problem no problem thank you so uh, mr pranav your question i will address in the next class it's a little uh, uh, serious topic so we will address it in the next class okay okay thank you yes okay thank you and uh, namaste everybody i will finish the class with our purnamada om purnamada purnamidam purnat purnamudachyate purnasya purnamadaya purnameva avasishyate om shanti 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 om tat sat thank you